Only one labor was left to complete to conquer the king of the third estate. Only one entrance led to the dark, the depths from which no mortal comes back. You made your way through fearful woods surrounded by crowds of trembling shades, great as the mobs that pushed through the streets to the Colosseum's pageants and fights, great as the crowd in Elis that swarms to witness the sacred Olympian games, great as the ranks on autumn's nights who celebrate Ceres' sacred rites, when initiates of Attic mysteries walk in procession through sleepless cities, so large are the multitudes pressing down toward Acheron's black and soundless plain. Greetings, friends. Special episode today about the greatest hero of all, Hercules. The Greeks called him Heracles. He was a man who descended into Hades itself, the land of the dead, as we just heard, and then rose out of it conquering death. I just read for you a passage from a play by Seneca. Do you know Seneca? Seneca's the Roman Stoic writer. He's gotten kind of popular in the past decade or so. He was a philosopher writing around the time of Plutarch, actually, maybe from the generation right before Plutarch, but they, they overlapped some. And Many people don't realize this. They've been reading Seneca's letters and essays, maybe. But he was also a great writer of literary works. He was not just a great writer of prose, but of poetry, too. Tragedies, specifically. And at times in history, he was well known for his tragedies. He was as well known for his tragedies, really, as for his philosophical essays and letters. Why am I telling you this? Well, good news one of America's great poets, and also a friend, has just come out with a new translation of one of Seneca's tragedies. It's called The Madness of Hercules, and the translator is Dana Joya. In Latin, that title is Hercules Furens, Hercules Furens, uh, Hercules when he was mad. And this is a play and an author who, as a dramatist, I mean, who profoundly influenced European drama, the, the, the stage of Europe, I mean, Spanish, Italian, French, and, and English. William Shakespeare was profoundly influenced by Seneca's tragedies. Seneca's tragedies much more so than the Greek tragedies, actually. And so I'm going to share with you some highlights of this play, this trans, new translation of Seneca's Hercules Ferenz, because I think it can teach us a lot, a lot about a lot of things, in particular, what it's like to overcome fear, what it's like to lose everything, what it's like to pick up the pieces and keep going, and what it's like to struggle hard. And also, I think it can teach a lot about what good poetry and what good art are, and these are very, very important matters, weighty matters for society and for anyone of true ambition. So, as you know, you're listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our primary mission to retell the lives of the great, real Greek and Roman heroes, the real, not mythic, mostly, following the lead of Plutarch's lives, the great collection of biographies from antiquity, our goal is to bring out the heroic in our own lives, in our own businesses, in our families, and in our world. Uh, but while I am working on this next biography, while that research continues, I thought I'd share with you some quick highlights of this excellent text that I had a chance to revisit, and revisit like never before. Now, tragedy, in the classical sense, is basically a serious staged story that features one or more heroes. Usually the hero suffers immensely, not always. And in the classical conception, a tragedy has to be in verse, in poetry. It's got rhythm. It's got poetic language. It doesn't have to rhyme, but it's, it's language set apart from the everyday. Just like the characters in tragedy are set apart from the everyday. You don't meet a hero every day. You don't meet a great man every day. And to translate poetry into poetry in another language, to translate from Latin, Seneca's Latin, into English, 
requires a special kind of poet. And Dana Joya is definitely that. And I'll let you look up his full bio if you want, but just here are some highlights, for example. So he's published reams of award-winning poetry. Of course, he was California's Poet Laureate for a number of years. He was the chair of the National Endowment for the Humanities from 2003 to 2009. And that's obviously a very administrative position. And, you know, he began his career actually in corporate America. So he knows affairs. He knows how to get things done, which I think is really cool to have in an author and uh, somebody who deals with literary works like this. He's been a commencement speaker at Stanford. I mean, the list goes on. So that's the poet. This is poetry, but it's tragedy and it's, uh, it's, it's grand stuff. So let's get into it. And I'm not going to give you a summary again, just like with the analysis, just highlights. But I think that this story is to the point of what we're trying to do here. And we'll see why as we go. But I just want to point out, this is a story about a hero that suffers. And, you know, I think Seneca, kind of like Plutarch, he believed, both of these guys are philosophers, he believed, just like Plutarch, in the power of stories about great figures, even if they are making great mistakes sometimes, or even if most of their life seems to be them making great mistakes. He believed in the power of stories like that to inspire, nonetheless, to instruct, and to make us stronger, to equip us somehow. So, let's get into it. The Madness of Hercules. So here's the basic background of the story. Hercules is, his, it's about his family. He's the illegitimate son of Jupiter, that is Zeus in Greek, but Jupiter in Latin. And his mother is a mortal woman, Alcmena. We don't meet her in the play, but his father is, uh, well, his sort of adoptive father, the Joseph to his Jesus, if you will. There's a guy named Amphitryon, and that's the husband of Alcmena. And Amphitryon treats Hercules as his son. He actually raises the boy as if he were his own child. So for several years, Hercules, and, and Amphitryon's in the play, he's a character. So for several years, Hercules has been exiled from his homeland. He's been off doing great tasks. His homeland is Thebes, a city that we've met many times in the Cost of Glory podcast, the real Thebes, just down the road from Athens. And Hercules has been, for various reasons, he's been compelled by the gods to serve a tyrant king, King Eurystheus. And King Eurystheus has been giving Hercules these great tasks to, to try to test him, maybe to try to kill him, dangerous superhuman labors. And really the, the, the reason that he's doing all this is because Juno is mad at him. Hera is mad at him or hates him. Hera is the wife of Zeus. And so she doesn't like that uh, Zeus was fooling around and having other children with other women. So this is why Hera's, Hera's name is sort of baked into Hercules' name. She's his divine nemesis mythologically. So it's Juno in Latin, though. And as the play opens, uh, Hercules, he's just completed his greatest labor of all. And we're going to see that it was uh, descending into hell to get the three-headed dog Cerberus, who guards the entrance to the, the palace, of to, to hell itself, and then also, it seems, to the palace of the rulers of hell, that's Hades, and, and he, he's often referred to as Pluto in the play. This Pluto is another name for Hades in Greek. And so where this play opens is basically Hercules is not back yet. And it starts with the, from the perspective of his family, who don't know if he's going to return, but Thebes has just been taken over by a tyrant. Lycus will meet him. But essentially, after this last labor, Hercules is finally coming home. He's finally free to join his family. He's, he's passed the test. And that's, that's where our story begins. Okay, the play opens with a monologue from the goddess Juno, from Hera. And the beginning of the play usually gives the motivation for the suffering that's going to happen in the play. And 
by the way, Seneca here is actually imitating an earlier Greek tragedy that we do have, Euripides' tragedy on Hercules. And there, there was no Juno in Euripides' tragedy, which I think is interesting. So this idea of we're about to hear from the goddess who's responsible for all the suffering in the play. She's going to give this one long speech and then disappear. But Seneca had some kind of idea here, some kind of agenda in including this long monologue from this goddess. So what does she say? Here's, here's how it begins. And I think this is kind of funny. It could also be scary, though. Either way, I love the way that Juno's contempt comes out in the poetry here. And there's, there's some strong language warning. So here we go. Very beginning of the play. Call me sister of the thunder god, Juno says. That is the only title I have left. Sister, she means. Once I was wife and queen to Jupiter, but now abandoned by his love and shamed by his perpetual adultery, I leave my palace to his mistresses. Why not choose earth when heaven is a whorehouse? Even the Zodiac has now become a pantheon of prostitutes and bastards. And she's looking at the sky right now, at the various deified characters that have become constellations. She says, look at Callisto shining in the north, that glittering slut who now guides the Argive fleet. Or see how Taurus rises in the south, not only messenger of the spring's warm nights, but the gross trophy of Europa's rape. Or count the stormy Pleiades, those nymphs who terrorize the waves once warmed Jove's bed. And we won't explain all of these, you can look them up. Watch young Orion swaggering with his sword, a vulgar upstart challenging the gods, while gaudy Perseus flaunts his golden star. Gape at the constellations Jove awarded. Zeus, Jupiter awarded. Jove is another name of his. Gape at the constellations he awarded Castor and Pollux, his twin bastard sons. And now not only Bacchus and his mother parade their ill-begotten rank in heaven, but my great husband, Lord of Lechery, discarding his last shred of decency, has crowned his drunken bastard slut with stars. But why rehearse long-standing grievances? Tonight I have to face new aggravation from Thebes, this crude, depressing, backward land, less a nation than a vast bordello, full of ripe country girls eager to make me stepmother to my husband's indiscretions. And now Alcmena will be deified to occupy my place among the gods, and Hercules, her son by Jupiter, is ready to assume his promised star, I hate this Hercules, end quote. You might have noticed there how Juno is looking at the beautiful night skies, the constellations, and, you know, she's contemplating the stars, and all she sees is her romantic rivals and her husband's infidelity. She's in the grip of passion, and in the grip of passion, we lose touch with objective reality and its beauty, and we only focus on the pain or the emotional intensity that we feel. So I think that's, that's kind of true to life. Seneca's captured something there. And so in, in Juno's soliloquy there, we, we get to the key point. Why is the play called The Madness of Hercules? Well, what's the fury part, the Hercules furens? What, what's the madness part? Well, Juno goes on here for a while, but, but then we get to a passage that I think illustrates it. She says, The time has come to turn my anger loose, to set it like a pack of starving wolves howling after this ambitious brute, to corner him, to rip him flesh from bone. I will not delegate my huge revenge, nor will I use more monsters as my proxy. He easily destroyed the ten great beasts King Eurystheus found. That method failed. No, even if the Titans were unchained, who challenged Jove, or if the burning caves of Etna were unbarred to free the buried giant whose slightest movement shakes the earth, she's talking about the volcano about Etna, 
or the cold moon poured down its cruelest fiends, I would not pit them all against this man, but there is one sure way to conquer him. I will make Hercules destroy himself. Let my voice shake the deepest pit of hell and wake the furies, daughters of the night. Come to me, sisters, with your hair alive and leaping flame, your dripping claws clamped tight around your scourges made of thrashing snakes. And as for Hercules, let him proceed, the arrogant fool, seeking his divinity, so confident he is superior to other men. Let him assume he left the underworld and all the ghosts behind, for I will show him hell on earth. There is a cavern buried deep in Tartarus where guilty souls are tortured through eternity by unappeasable guardians of pain. I summon up those primal deities. Come to me, discord, goddess of destruction. Bring up the secret horrors of the damned that even Hercules has never seen. Come to me, goddess of violence and rash impiety whose filthy hands are stained with family blood. Come to me, error, and come to me, you whom I most desire, goddess madness who turns men on themselves, you who will be the spur of my revenge. Well, how about that? Isn't poetry better when you read it aloud? Well, good poetry is, for sure. So in those last passages there, Juno is addressing these various deified abstract concepts, discord, destruction, madness, error, and she's summoning them all to do her will. And what exactly she has in mind is not completely clear. Uh, you might know the story if you're a Roman reader that Seneca had in mind. You, you, you probably would have known how this all ends. And we'll get there. But everyone kind of knows the story. And Seneca's mission here, in fact, is it's not so much about telling how it happened. but uh, And Joya talks about this in his, in his intro essay. And he's, he's right. It's about examining how these characters felt internally when it was all happening and here we get the kind of rage of heaven this interesting character juno you might have heard of a poem called the aeneid about the hero the founding hero of rome aeneas and there juno is this also this kind of divine nemesis figure who's trying to destroy Aeneas. And so there's a kind of a parallel here between the rage of Juno there and the rage of Juno here. But, you know, the god's role in Seneca is is sort of a, an interesting one. He doesn't quite, I mean, he doesn't really believe that they're like this in a lot of ways, but but he depicts them this way. I think it's interesting that Seneca gives voice to the rage of Juno, the scorned wife and her fury. Moving on here. So after Juno's monologue, she steps off, never to return in the play. And the chorus comes on. And the chorus in, in classical tragedy is the voice of citizens. In some of the earlier tragedies like Aeschylus, they're, they're characters in the story. It's like the, the townsfolk are, you know, interacting with the characters, the, the main protagonist, for example. But they're... They're not really characters in the story in Seneca. They don't really interact with the actors. But in both cases, the chorus represents the thoughts of society watching these things as they unfold. And sometimes the chorus dispenses a little wisdom here and there. This uh, I'll read you a little passage from this first choral ode. This is kind of funny. The, the first choral ode is, is the, so it's the elders of Thebes. That's the chorus throughout the play. So this is old men from Thebes. And in this first choral ode, they're just kind of singing about how they're common folk. We're just honest country people. We're just looking at the stars, looking at nature. You know, songbirds sing. Harbors are filled with boats. Then the fishermen go out. They're just kind of observing life and, and kind of chilling. And it, I think it's kind of like Seneca's imagining what it must be like to be a regular person. You got to remember, Seneca is one of the richest men in Rome. 
Uh, he's not entirely self-made, but he's he's risen up on his talent. And through a lot of favor from the Emperor Nero, he was Nero's tutor. And he's now writing as an adult. He's, he's kind of locked in at the court of Nero in Rome. And, you know, Seneca's one of the few sane people here at the court of, of Nero, and, and so we think. And you, you got to imagine he must have wondered what exactly it was like to have not done this with his life. So I think he's kind of doing that here. And there's a nice example of wisdom the chorus has here. And I think this passage is interesting because it shows how Seneca, given where he is in life, he's capable of really profound cynicism. It's hard not to be cynical at the court of Nero. Here he is. Here's the chorus, I mean. Let ambition rule the city where truth and virtue are sold short, where suitors sleep in rich men's doorways and poets lisp their lies in court. Let the miser count his riches, always aching to have more. Each new coin adds to his nightmare of his death, unloved and poor. Noble politicians preach virtue to the shifting mob, defenders of a commonwealth, no one else but they can rob. The happy few who live in peace realize it may not last. The slightest change of fortune may annihilate the gentle past. While fate permits, enjoy this life. Death stalks us all with steady pace. The wheel of time moves ever forward. The steps we take, we can't retrace. So passages like that really kind of make me think, you wonder, is Seneca kind of speaking in his own voice? The Stoic philosopher, surrounded by wealth and luxury and honors and ambition. He's trying not to yearn for all this wealth and status that he has, that he could lose. He knows he could lose it just at the snap of a finger. Wondering what all his success has really given him. So here's the chorus of old men of Thebes again. Let others seek far-reaching glory. Salute the crowd from triumph's car. Gain immortality and story. Be deified in a shining star. But grant me just one quiet acre, a humble cottage far from trouble, to live out my allotted span, though great cities fall to rubble. Constant references here, by the way, we already read some earlier from Juno, Hercules has been promised to that he's going to ascend into the heavens and be deified and not not die because he's the son of Zeus. But that, that promise hasn't been fulfilled yet. So there's a kind of you know hope of getting everything you want as the backdrop to this story about Hercules. So after the chorus comes on and maybe comes off the stage, there enter. Hercules' family. And this is the first scene. The cast here is two characters, Megara and Amphitryon. Megara is Hercules' wife. And we have to imagine that they're accompanied by three children who don't say anything, but they're there on the stage. And then there's Amphitryon, his mortal dad. Once again, the story really centers around them and Hercules' relationship to them. So the first one to speak here, they, they walk on the stage, they're talking to each other. The first one to speak is Amphitryon, and he describes the current situation from their perspective. They're waiting for Hercules. They're hoping, but they're very sad. They're not really sure he's going to return. Amphitryon's trying to be positive. Megara's kind of doom and gloom, woe. And Amphitryon goes into a little bit of detail about Hercules that I'm going to read because I think it's interesting. We get to know Hercules a little bit as a man from this passage. So he says, Juno has persecuted him since birth. Even his cradle was not free from danger. He had to fight off monsters before he knew what monsters were. Once Juno sent two huge serpents to kill him. As their crested heads rose to attack, the infant crept toward them his wide eyes meeting their ferocious gaze. He calmly seized a serpent in each hand and pulled their thrashing bodies from the floor. His tiny fingers crushed their swollen throats. Such was his early practice for the Hydra. 
famous story of the baby Hercules killing the serpents sent to kill him by Juno. You know the hardships brought by his 12 labors, and and uh, Amphitryon's just going to go through his 12 labors here. And if you're not familiar with the labors of Hercules, it's good to familiarize yourself with them. Here they are. We're not going to go into each and every one of them and explain them, but it's a nice list. You know the hardships brought by his 12 labors, of how he struggled for a year to track the swift gold-antlered stag of Minolus, and how he found the fierce Nemean lion then crushed the roaring monster in his arms. That's two so far. Need I recall how, seizing Diomedes, he fed the king to his man-eating steeds, or how he killed the Aramanthian boar who terrorized the forests of Arcadia, and caught the Cretan bull that had destroyed a hundred towns, or how in distant Spain he slaughtered the three-headed Geryon and took the giant's oxen as his booty, that herd now grazes on our own Mount Kithiron. When ordered to explore the torrid wastes of northern Africa where the hot white noon where the white hot noon scorches the sand, he stood between two mountains, and pushing them apart made a wide path for the cool ocean waters to pour in. He found the grove of the Hesperides and stole its golden apples from the dragon, and he did not at last destroy it. And did he not at last destroy by fire the fierce nine-headed hydra of the swamp? He shot down all the bronze Stymphalian birds whose swarming wings would block the noonday sun. He seized the armored belt of Queen Hippolyta, the virgin monarch of the Amazons. He even put his noble hands to work and cleaned the filthy stables of Augeas. What good did all this do him? Hercules is banished from the world that he defended. End quote. The hero's unappreciated. Always, always the hero is underappreciated, sometimes completely unappreciated in myth. So reading tragedy is a great way to learn your mythology if you want to learn it. If you want to know all the references, you know, don't go on Wikipedia. I mean, you could look them up in Wikipedia reference books, but it's best to just read the original classical texts about myth. And basically the key texts there for your reference, are Homer, Hesiod, and Greek tragedy. That's uh, six plays by Aeschylus, seven by Sophocles, 18 or so by Euripides, probably half of those ones by Euripides you could skip. And uh, then Seneca would be another place to go. There are eight or nine, depending on whether you count some as certain one as genuine or not. But anyway, so that's a great way to learn mythology if you're into that. But Amphitryon and Megara, the wife of Hercules. They get to talking. Megara is very sad. Hercules is gone. They're doomed. There's a tyrant on the throne. He's, there's, this guy has seized the throne of Thebes from the legitimate king, a bad guy named Lycus. Amphitryon, he tries to cheer her up, offers a little wisdom here. And I think it's worth our attention here. Here's what he says. Dear daughter-in-law, you must have some faith. You are a loyal wife. You have shown such care in raising our brave Hercules' sons. Summon some courage yourself. He'll come back. He always does, the greater for his labor. Megara responds, The things unhappy people want too much, they start believing in. Amphitryon says, I disagree. The danger is that those who fear too much believe their problems are unsolvable. Fear makes the world seem darker than it is. So she's thinking about how the gods have abandoned Hercules. They're never going to see him again. Amphitryon says, no, you know, we have to keep optimistic. We have to keep living our lives. Well, isn't fear often, our response to fear often, the decision that determines whether we become the best version of ourselves or not? A lesser version instead because we give in to fear? Okay, so as they're talking, in busts the tyrant. Lycus is his name. Lycus means wolf in Greek. And as they say in Latin, nomen omen, the name is an omen. Your, your name can prophesy things about you, and you know, he is kind of a wolf. So Lycus starts this bragging speech. 
Now I am sovereign over all of Thebes, its wealthy towns, its sloping countryside, and all the lush valley of the swift as menace river. Even the isthmus stretching to the south. Stand on the summit of Mount Kithiron, and everything you see in all directions is mine. But no one ever gave it to me. I am no heir. I have no noble name or great estate of ancient lineage. No lofty family tree or courtly title. All I was given was ferocious courage. Nobles who brag about their ancestors extol the virtues that belong to others. And he's going to announce here like a, a big plot twist. Right now, he's just been bragging about how he's a self-made man, but he's, he's about to talk about how it's, you know, it's hard being a self-made man. But when you seize a dynasty... You hold it nervously in your hands. Only sheer force can keep it yours. Everything you possess against the people's will comes by the sword. No kingdom built on foreign soil is safe. But there exists one person who can help. You ready for this? There exists one person who can help secure my throne. The king's surviving daughter. Oh yes, I I forgot about this. I forgot to mention this. Megara is the daughter of the king of Thebes that Lycus has just murdered. So that's another reason for her to be sad and discouraged. And so Lycus, he says, if I could take Megara as my bride, her ancient blood would give my new regime legitimacy in the public eye. That's the twist. And this is something that is not in Euripides, but Lycus has murdered the legitimate king, the father of Megara, the father-in-law of Hercules, and he's trying to take the throne from he's taken the throne for himself, and now he's trying to forcibly he's he's going to basically propose to Megara, marry me, or I could just kill you. That's your choice, and uh, and the upshot of the conversation that they have. I won't go through it. They have a back and forth, but it's basically Megara says, no, I'll, I'll take death instead of betraying Hercules and implicitly my father too. And they walk off stage with that crisis point. And then the chorus comes in, the old men of Thebes, as often to give a sense of the passing of time after a crisis in the action here. And the chorus of old men, they comment on how crazy it is that Hercules descended into hell. And they bring up this mythic precedent as they're going along here. And I think it's interesting. It's, it's a story I'll, I'll read you here. It's good to know. Shows up a lot in art and culture. And maybe it's foreshadowing. Maybe it's ominous. So the, the story that they retell is the story of Orpheus, which is basically Orpheus, this mythical musician who could charm the rocks and the stop a river in its in its course with his song his lover Eurydice dies and she goes down to Hades and he goes down into Hades himself and he uh, persuades hell to let her come back into the light to come back to life and he has to walk back up the passage with her leading her but he can't look at her that's the deal that he makes with death he can't look back and just as he's about to reach the light Of course, she stumbles and he, in a moment of neglect, mental neglect, he looks back and, uh, and she falls back down to hell and he loses her forever. So it's a very tragic story, but I'll read it here for you. And this is a choral passage. So as often in these choral passages, the language is very lyric and extra poetic and vivid. I'll read it for you here. Once Orpheus subdued with song, the desolate lords of death and won his wife's release. His art could charm the trees, make rocks weep, birds throng, stop a river in its bed. The soundless vault of hell had never heard a song of such sad melody. It echoed in all ears, and even Eurydice cried at her own destiny. The solemn lords of the dead, who had relinquished tears, and the judges who oversee the tortures of the damned, all wept for Eurydice. Pluto approved his petition. That's Hades, that's the Lord of the Dead. We are defeated, he said. You may lead her back to life, but I put down one condition. 
You must walk ahead of your wife and not turn back your eyes till you leave the land of the dead and reach the open skies. But love could bear no delay. Orpheus turned to his prize, and Eurydice melted away. The underworld was once subdued by song, but now the darkness battles with the strong. So, Orpheus didn't make it back with everything intact. Hercules, is he going to make it back? If he does, is he going to lose something like Orpheus did? So I think there's some dramatic irony there. I'm going to read you the first eight lines of that passage in Latin, just so you can hear what it sounded like with the meter, with Seneca's poetic Latin here. It's just eight lines, so you can fast forward if you want, but here it is. In me tes potuit flectere cantibus, umbrarum dominos et preque supplici orfeus, eurudiken dum repetit suam, quae silva set aves, saxaque traxerat, ars quae praebuerat fluminibus moras, ad cuius sonitum constiterant ferae, mulcet non solitis vocibus inferos, et surdis resonat clarius in locis. So then finally, halfway through the play, Hercules finally arrives. And he's accompanied by Theseus, who is a legendary king of Athens, who died, and Hercules rescues him from the dead too, according to the version of Euripides. And he's uh, dragging out with him, dragging along Cerberus, the dog the, of, uh, of hell, the, the guardian of, of Hades, this three-headed dog. And you wonder how to stage that, right? Like, how do you drag Cerberus onto the stage? That would be a, a very interesting thing to see on a Roman stage, or, or on any stage, really, I would think. Hercules greets his family. I won't go all through it. He hears the news that Lycus, basically he sees Amphitryon there, and Megara is, uh, has put on some mourning clothes, and he's like, guys, aren't we supposed to be happy here? I'm back. And they tell him the news. Megara's just been basically condemned to death, and Hercules is like, all right, I'm going to sort this out. And he, he, he leaves Theseus there to guard over his family while he goes to uh, sort out King or tyrant Lycus. So he leaves the stage. And Amphitryon and Theseus have an inter interesting interaction here that I think Seneca is really interested in. Theseus as a character to, to tell the story of what it was like going down to Hades, what they saw. Seneca, very fascinated by death. I think through all of his writings, you can see the Stoics have this idea that the whole of life is a preparation for death. They got that from Plato to some extent. But this just runs as a thread throughout Seneca. And, and here's a chance for Seneca, through the character of Theseus, to kind of contemplate the traditional version of what the afterlife is like. This is the mythic story of what the underworld is like. Seneca doesn't really believe in this stuff. It's the literary tradition. It's popular religion. But he goes on for a few pages. And I think it's really one of the highlights of the book. It's just very well told with a lot of panache and feeling. And he goes on and on. And you have to wonder, why does he seem so fascinated by it, Seneca? Or why is he so determined to evoke a response in the audience, I think, about what the underworld was like? A response of fear, or horror, or fascination, wonder, awe. And uh, here's maybe, maybe the climax of this story. Well, here it goes. Amphitryon says, Theseus, tell us what it was like in the underworld. And Theseus says, oh, I shudder to tell. And Amphitryon says, no, 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 you must. He says, please overcome your fear, King Theseus, and don't deny yourself the best reward that comes from hardship. Terrors that we suffer often become sweet in the retelling. Give us the truth, however terrible. And that's a nice statement of tragic aesthetics, by the way. Terrors that we suffer often become sweet in the retelling. Okay, so Theseus begins. 
I ask permission then from all the gods, especially from Pluto, whose vast realm encompasses all creatures that are mortal, and Proserpina, his captive queen. That's Persephone. Allow me to tell the secrets buried in the earth and to describe the sufferings of the dead. There is a famous cliff on Sparta's coast, a headland covered by a thick-grown wood, where Cape Tynarus juts into the sea. It's here the mouth of Hades opens up, the high cliffs split apart, and a huge cave, a gaping chasm, stretches its vast jaws and makes an entrance wide enough for all mankind. At first the way is not entirely dark, some daylight filters down and gives the cave that same bleak iridescence the sun shows in eclipse. But gradually the path descends into unending twilight. Your vision blurs, and only feeble streaks of red and violet shimmer in the dark, like the last fading embers of a sunset. But then the pathway opens to a vast and empty place, a hazy nothingness that all the human race must come to fill. The journey now seems easy. The path itself begins to draw you down, like waves that sweep whole fleets of ships unwillingly off course. Wind pushes at your back. The dark turns ravenous, and shadows stretch out from the walls to clutch. They let no one return. So he's, Theseus is describing his own experience of dying there, because he died and then he came, he's just come back. All right. Now at the bottom, the river Lethe runs as boundary, quiet and smooth, curving across the plain. One drink will wash away the memory of all life's sorrow to prevent the souls from turning back to find the world of light. The peaceful river twists and twists again, just as the slow meander river does in Phrygia, which bends back on itself so many times that travelers scarcely know whether it seeks the seacoast or its source. So there's a, there's, this is the typical traditional geography of hell, or Hades. It's not exactly hell, but it, you know, it's close enough. Beyond the Lethe lies the foul Cocytus, river of tears, motionless as a swamp, where starving vultures and the mournful owl shriek overhead their prophecies of pain. Here in the branches of a black-leafed yew sits drowsy sleep, while desperate famine lies writhing on the ground, stretching her wide jaws. These are abstract personifications here. Sleep, famine... There's a few more. Here, futile shame averts his burning face, always too late. In thin anxiety, stalks nervously, pursued by dark-eyed fear. Here, gnashing pain appears and black-robed sorrow, trembling disease and iron-vested war. Then last of all, old age, his staff in hand, tottering forward step by painful step. And so this goes on a few pages. Again, it's I think it's one of the highlights of the book. And here's maybe the climax. Amphitryon keeps kind of encouraging him on, and he says, Tell me the story of my son's adventure. Did Pluto willingly give up his beast? Or did my son wage battle for the prize? So he's saying, tell the story of how Hercules finished his last labor, got the dog Cerberus from Hades, from Pluto. All right, Theseus goes on here. A high black cliff looms over that still shore, and no waves break across the stagnant shallows where ancient Charon tends his river ford. Charon is the ferryman of Hades. He, he takes you across the river on this boat. You have to pay your way. This is, uh, and then you can't go back. Traditional image here. Okay, so Charon. His face is terrible. His clothes are rags. I love the pacing in this passage, by the way. His face is terrible. His clothes are rags. He crowds the trembling phantoms to the raft and ferries them across. His beard is grizzled. His filthy cloak hangs from a shoulder knot. His cheeks are sunken like a corpse but he swings the huge pole to push the heavy craft. Then emptying his raft across the river, he brings the empty vessel back to load the teeming shadows waiting on the shore. And so then Hercules gets on the raft, it kind of creaks 
Uh, this is water splashes on. Caron's kind of surprised. He's not used to handling such a heavy load. All right. So here's the fight scene. Hercules gets to the House of Hades. Soon Pluto's palace rose up into view where the ferocious dog of Hades stood, guarding the kingdom. Tossing its three heads, it cowed the shadows with its piercing barks. Around each snarling head, its tangled mane bristled with vipers, and its thrashing tail ended in a hissing dragon's head. Its shape was the embodiment of anger. It heard the steps approaching and looked up, its neck alive with snakes, its ears erect, and keen enough to hear a shadow's footfall. But when the son of Jupiter appeared and stepped into the cave, the dog crouched, snarling. The two great foes each felt the thrill of danger. Then suddenly the quiet cavern shook with terrifying howls. The serpents thrashed and hissed along its back. So deafening was the savage barking from its triple throat. Even the blessed spirits froze with terror. Then Hercules took off his lion's skin, wrapped it around his left arm as a shield, and thrust its head and jaws at Cerberus. Defended by the bulky hide, he raised his other arm and swung his massive club. First left, then right, he beat the savage hound from side to side with an incessant volley. At last, the dog gave up, spent from the combat. Bruised and defeated, it lowered its three heads, surrendering the entrance. On their thrones, the king and queen of hell sat terrified. Not only did they let him take the dog, when Hercules demanded my release, they gave me to him as a royal tribute. Then, stroking the repulsive monster's necks, he collared them with adamantine chains. The sleepless guardian of hell forgot its feigned ferocity. It drooped its ears, trembling and willing to be led away. With muzzles down, it followed its new master, the snake-tipped tail whiplashing side to side. So that was the battle that was Hercules defeating Cerberus. And then Theseus goes on here. There were some issues getting the dog into the light. It, it panicked, wasn't used to that sort of thing. But Hercules managed it. It almost dragged him back down into hell. But, you know, Hercules managed to bring, bring Cerberus into the light. And there was much rejoicing. People there meet him on the surface, and uh, they're stunned and, and happy. I want to read you one more choral passage here. I began the episode with this passage. So uh, the chorus, at this point, kind of ends up singing a, about the triumph of Hercules. Triumph of Hercules over death, over Hades. And he's about to come off uh, from, from back. He's about to come back on from offstage once again, too, in a second here. So this eventually, this choral ode builds to a kind of a climactic, joyous moment from the perspective of the characters in the drama. They're happy. Hercules is about to come back with some more good news about beating Lycus. But so there's a climactic, joyous moment, but we all know that something is off. We've heard Juno's speech, right, at the beginning. So the end of this, I think, is a little bit painful. But the chorus here, they're celebrating this victory. And in this very moment, in the middle of this victory song, Seneca takes us on a little contemplative digression to sit and think about death. And he really wants us to do that. There's something therapeutic about this in his opinion. If you read his letters, this is very clear. So, you know, you could, uh, contemplating death, memini mori, you could sit there and stare at a skull. That's one way. Or... You could just read this choral passage. Here it is. Only one labor was left to complete, to conquer the king of the third estate. Only one entrance led to the dark, the depths from which no mortal comes back. You made your way through fearful woods, surrounded by crowds of trembling shades, great as the mobs that pushed through the streets to the Colosseums, pageants, and fights. Great as the crowd in Elis that swarms to witness the sacred Olympian games. Great as the ranks on autumn nights who celebrate Ceres' as sacred rites, when initiates of Attic mysteries walk in procession through sleepless cities, so large are the multitudes pressing down toward Acheron's black and soundless plain. 
Some move slowly, hardly grieving. The years have dulled their taste for living. And it's interesting here. He's going to give the description of different people dying in different stages of life and kind of the states of mind which which they all go down to death. Some move slowly, hardly grieving. The years have dulled their taste for living. But others run, untouched by age. Maidens too young to be given in marriage. Slender schoolboys with hair unshorn, and infants still lisping their mother's name. To ease the weeping children's fright, they alone are given torches to light their downward path, but others must grope, somber and blind, step by slow step. Spirits of the dead, what did you feel when light dimmed, and each sad soul sensed earth's irresistible force pressing down on your helpless face? The dense disorder of dark without shape, the sickening cast of night, the deep stillness of a world without sound, and empty clouds in a windless land. Let old age delay in bringing us there. None come too late to that dim shore where none return. Why should men hasten to find their oblivion? The countless multitudes covering earth must come at last to the shadow of death and sail on cockatus moonless tide. For you, O oh death, all things have been made. Spare us today who tomorrow are lost, for you will surely command us at last. Though you are patient, we hurry ourselves. The hour of birth has cost us our lives. Very Seneca and sentiment there. And then suddenly there's, there's the happy part of the chorus. Kind of comes out of the blue. To Thebes has come the joyful day. On each high altar we will slay our choicest sacrificial beast. Now to prepare the lavish feast. Summon the workers from the field to taste the fruits their labors yield. Put down your plows and all join hands. Dance to the merry-making bands. For Hercules returns to bring peace after all our suffering. Peace stretches east where dawns must rise and west where sunsets paint the skies and reaches southward till it's past where tropic suns no shadows cast. To every shore the ocean's border, Hercules has brought new order. He crossed the rivers of the dead and took the crown from Pluto's head. Now he returns and all is well. Hail to the man who conquered hell. The victor comes. Now let him wear the wreath of poplar in his hair. And Hercules enters and he's covered with blood. And he says, I am avenged. With my own hands, I've crushed the bloodied face of Lycus in the dust. Then I destroyed his henchmen. Those who shared the tyrant's power have shared his punishment. End quote. And he's invincible in this moment, so it seems. And then, at this very moment of elation, the tragedy strikes. Juno strikes, and it's powerful, it's heavy. I'm not going to read it here, but I'll tell you what happens. Hercules, and this is the story that Seneca got from the mythic tradition. Hercules is driven mad, and he starts to hallucinate, and he starts to see enemies all around him, the many monsters that he's slain. He, he imagines in his madness that they're all coming back from the dead and attacking him, and he sees the, the gods and the stars all attacking him, and he ends up panicking and he picks up his bow and he shoots his young sons dead all three of them his family try to stop him but they fail and all they can do is watch and the great man the conqueror of death the savior of his people becomes his own victim and hercules does eventually in the course of the play regain his senses but it's too late, and he's horrified. And he prays for heaven to strike him down dead. And it's very moving. I encourage you to pick up a copy of the book. I think it's best to, to, to read that passage sort of in the moment of being there with the book or seeing it on the stage. Devote all your attention to it. Uh, but Hercules, at this point, he resolves to commit suicide. He prays for his father Zeus to strike him down dead. And, and uh, his and father Amphitryon, however, 
manages to talk him down. And Hercules goes off. He decides to go into exile to face more suffering. And, and I'll read you here the last speech of, that Hercules, Hercules... And I'll read for you here the last speech that Hercules makes to give you a sense of Seneca's interest in these emotional states of people undergoing the worst possible suffering. And I, I really think, again, that Seneca thinks this is somehow necessary for us to do if we are to become the fullest versions of ourselves, to expose ourselves to the pain of others, to imagine it vividly, maybe, to feel it, and figure out what to do, figure out how to face pain without fear in our own lives. So here's Hercules, finally lost everything. What country shall I seek? Where shall I hide? What land will bury me? Can all the waters of the Nile or Dawn, the raging Tigris flooding Persia's shore, the savage Rhine, the golden Tagus, roiled with Spain's resplendent sand, wash clean these hands? If cold Crimea pours its icy sea, if all great Neptune's ocean rinsed my hands, the deep-set stains would cling in Carnadine. What country will receive me so unclean? I don't know whether to turn east or west. Known everywhere, I have no place of exile. The world recoils from me. Even the stars twist sideways in their courses, shunning me. And Helios would rather turn his face to shine on Cerberus. O oh, Theseus, my loyal lord, find me some hiding place, remote, obscure. You've always been humane and judging sinners. Show me mercy now in recompense for aid I've given you. Return me to the underworld of shadows and load me with the chains that once held you. That place will shelter me, even though hell knows what I've done. So, what does it mean, friends? Is it that sometimes when we get to the top, there is something within us that poses a greater risk to us than anything external? Something that, if we're not careful, could destroy us or cause us to neglect or destroy the very things that we hold most dear? A moment of rage or blindness you spend your whole life holding something back, and then maybe you let your guard down. Or, or you don't, and you just fear that it's going to slip out in a single moment and ruin you. Do you ever have a dream like that? Or is the madness of Hercules about unleashing the chaos of hell upon earth somehow? Does it have something to do, in Seneca's mind, with the fact that Hercules broke a border that shouldn't be broken? Is it actually a cautionary tale against striving for immortality for Seneca? And what do we think of that, if so? Is that right? Is there some lesson there about the Roman Empire, about the monarchy that Seneca lived and worked in? That great men, no matter how great the benefits that they offer the rest of us, if they're put at the very top of the pyramid, sole rulers, that they're always tempted by madness and that we should be careful before praying to switch places with them, whether it's the pyramid that was the Roman Empire or a very successful corporation or a city or a state. Well, I don't know. But for the full lesson, I highly recommend this book. Dana has spent many years and many drafts thinking about how to bring Seneca to life best in English. And this is really a tour de force. See the... Links in the show notes. And hopefully, I've made the case that whatever we're doing, whatever mission we're on in life, we have a lot to gain from reading and maybe someday watching on the stage the madness of Hercules. Stay strong, stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Till next time. <laughs>